Hello, I'm Ed Lugo. I'm here to take you on a visit to the circus using stamps, postal cards, photos, and postal covers. Our visit to the circus has been arranged by Roland Essig, late of Wisconsin, together with the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library and the American Topical Association. Let's get started on our trip to the circus. In the early 1800s in America, small acts and circuses began traveling the great American rivers by steamboat. John Ringling, later becoming a circus kingpin, got his inspiration for a circus while sitting on the bank of the Mississippi, watching a showboat dock. Later in the century, performers began using the newly constructed American railroads to transport their acts and equipment. The performers traveled from town to town on dusty or muddy roads to perform before the local town folk, often in the open air without the benefit of the big top tent. These performers included balancing acts, jugglers, acrobats, tumblers, and tightrope walkers. As the small circuses drew larger crowds, shelters became necessary to protect the audience from the elements. Thus, the big top tent was born. As the tents arose from the dusty or muddy fields, the rhythmic sounds rang out as the roustabouts drove the large tent stakes into the ground. Mixed in the banging was the occasional sound of elephants trumpeting as they helped the workers with the heavy lifting. By the end of the 19th century, hundreds of circuses of various sizes were touring North America, Russia, France, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Many of these circuses featured Asian performers. In the early 20th century, many of the small circuses began consolidating creating the most famous of all the circuses at the direction of several men, including Carl Hagenbeck, P.T. Barnum, James Anthony Bailey, and the Ringling Brothers. Mommy, Daddy, the circus is coming! The circus is coming! Imagine the excitement when the advance man came to announce that the circus is coming and to make all of the necessary arrangements before its arrival. As the circus was unloaded and the big top erected, the biggest draw to the town folk became the circus parade. The purpose of the parade was to get the people charged up and wanting to buy a ticket to the main performance. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is known for its circus parade, using the wagons from the Circus World Museum in Baraboo, Wisconsin. For several years, Paul Sparrow of Zeering, Iowa, brought his 40-horse hitch to the parade. This hitch pulled the Baraboo bandwagon carrying an actively performing band. The team consisted of 10 rows of four Belgian draft horses in each row. It was one of the most phenomenal sights of the Great Parade. Clowns performed many functions, including cavorting with the spectators as they walked alongside the circus parade to the sound of steam calliope music. During the circus performance, they filled time between acts. They also could be called in at any time from Clown Alley at the back of the Big Top. One of the most famous American joeys, another word for clowns, was Emmett Kelly. His red hair, sad sack white mouth, and red nose were known worldwide. His Willie the Tramp would not use slapstick humor, but instead sad little actions like trying to sweep the spotlight away with a broom, or even just sitting on the edge of the circus ring, staring sadly into space. Come one, come all, buy your ticket right now. Witness the strangest and the strongest, the weirdest and the wildest, the tallest and the smallest, the thinnest and the fattest. Experience all of these and many more for a single Small fee, step right up. The circus talker enticed the public to buy tickets to enter the sideshow to see fire eaters, strongmen, acrobats, and other acts. He also enticed the public to buy a ticket to the main tent performance. He was an expert at delivering his ballyhoo from the platform at the entrance to the sideshow known as the bally. 
The circus ring as we know it was established by an Englishman, Sergeant Mayor Philip Astley, in the 1760s. Astley operated a trick-riding expedition in London and is sometimes credited with originating the modern circus. The ring was particularly useful for equestrian acts, since horses could be easily trained to run the ring. Interestingly, the circus ring has always been a standard 42 feet in diameter. As the circus grew in size, additional rings were added. Finally, the well-known three-ring circus emerged. In his boots, black tights, white shirt, red tails, and top hat, the commanding and flamboyant ringmaster was in charge of all three circus rings. The ringmaster makes the show flow. He announces the acts in his deep commanding voice. He takes charge of who performs when and in what ring. He masterfully directs the attention of the spectators. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, fans of all ages, welcome to the greatest show on earth. For you are about to witness the most magnificent death-defying spectacle any audience has ever seen under the big top. Lift your eyes right now, high above the center ring. Focus closely on the trapezes erected there and watch closely because these performers fly high and fast. Here are the amazing flying cadence. Let the show begin. Our next act comes to us from far away, exactly halfway around the world. You will have to stretch your head way back and crane your neck to see that high wire up above. Please welcome, all the way from Australia, the most famous and grandest of the world's high wire performers, Con Caliano! And now, be amazed at the magnificent feats of the human body performed by these gymnasts as they fling themselves into the air, ignoring the laws of gravity, somersault, and land with breathtaking accuracy. Acrobatic acts cover a broad group of circus performers. They do somersaults, jumping and balancing acts on the ground, in the air, on low tight ropes, on seesaws, and on hoops and other juggling objects. These acts always involve high energy bounding and jumping. And now cover your ears, but open your eyes wide to see this daredevil risk life and limb as he is propelled across the ring by what? Yes! unbelievably by a cannon. I give you the fantastic, the shocking, the cataclysmic, the human cannonball. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I direct your attention to the space high above the center ring. Coming to us from throughout the world are amazing and breathtaking balancing wonders. Equilibrists perform balancing acts and acrobatic acts at the same time. They usually can quiet the rowdy circus crowd so that you can hear a pin drop. Even the circus band stops playing for the only time during a performance, except perhaps a soft drum roll at the most difficult portion of the act. Ladies and gentlemen, in the first ring, you will now witness the impossible accomplished before your very eyes. The human body cannot be expected to contort in such a way. Prepare to be aghast.
The circus began with trick riding and performing horses, and to this day, these acts are exceedingly popular. Audiences love the beautiful horses and the lovely ladies who ride them. White horses were used. The rosin used to keep riders from falling off did not show on the white horse. Many horse acts do not involve riders. Instead, a trainer puts the horse through their paces, trotting around the ring. These performances sometimes include rearing and walking on the hind legs, performing other physical tricks, and occasionally involving what seems to be intellectual feats, such as counting or spelling. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the act you've been awaiting the entire evening, I call your attention to the center ring. While you have been watching the antics of our clown patrol, our roustabouts have been erecting the large cage that will contain for your pleasure an even two dozen big cats who will be faced by our famous lion tamer, Clyde Beatty. Faithfully and faithfully, he has worked with these animals until they obey his every motion and whip snap. Let the big cats in and on with the show! Clyde Beatty was one of the premier performers with big cats. In 1928, he set a record for a mixed cat act, performing with 28 lions and tigers. Other animals entertained the circus crowds. Animal care, of necessity, was one of the most demanding and expensive parts of the circus. In 1916, at the Baraboo Winter Quarters, the resting circus housed and cared for 500 horses and ponies, 29 elephants, 15 camels, 20 other hay-eating animals, tigers, lions, monkeys, and birds, including ostriches. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now present for your entertainment the most stupendous, magnificent, super colossal spectacle. On this tiny, little, insignificant ball, we will construct for you a pyramid. Not of wood, not of stone, not of metal, but of pachyderms. One by one, our elephants become the building blocks of our magnificent pyramid. The most famous elephant who ever performed in a circus was Jumbo. The word now describes anything of gargantuan size because Jumbo was really, really, really big. Jumbo was imported into the U.S. in 1882 by P.T. Barnum. Because of his size, he was unable to perform, but instead was paraded to show off his size and endearing himself to the audiences. He died three years later in a train accident while the circus was on the move. Music was a very important part of the circus. We have heard calliope music and the circus band music. The music almost never stopped during a circus performance. Since March music does not lend itself to the circus atmosphere well, the Stars and Stripes Forever March by John Philip Sousa is the only march that has ever been played at a circus. This piece has been called the Disaster March. It is well understood in the circus world that when the circus band takes up this march, it is a true life-threatening emergency, and the music serves as a call to all circus personnel to run to the big top, to help in any way they can in whatever emergency has resulted in the band taking up this march. It might be a fall from the trapeze, an escaped animal, a major medical emergency, or a fire. The Stars and Stripes Forever was played by the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus on July 6, 1944, when a disastrous fire broke out in Hartford, Connecticut. Circus museums can be found in Baraboo, Wisconsin and Sarasota, Florida. Baraboo, Wisconsin's Circus World Museum uses several of the old winter quarters of the Ringling Brothers Circus. With many new buildings, the museum houses a miniature circus display poster collections, a library and research facility, live circus performances, and a collection of over 200 circus wagons and other vehicles. It is truly a treasure allowing visitors to experience the heyday of those great old circuses. 
Some of the great circuses of the world have chosen to de-emphasize their large animal acts because of animal rights concerns. Earlier, virtually all had eliminated the sideshow attractions featuring human beings. Many of these have been replaced with other acts involving performers and will undoubtedly give rise to better staged and managed circuses with the same thrill and appeal that gave rise to them in the first place. On behalf of the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library and the American Topical Association, I would like to thank you for your attention during our visit to the circus. We hope that we have made the subject of circuses a most entertaining one for you as a stamp collector. At the RMPL located in Denver, Colorado, you'll find many books and journals on numerous aspects of the hobby. You are welcome to join us at the library or by viewing our videos on YouTube or on our website. The American Topical Association invites you to learn about the hundreds of topical subjects that can be found on the hobby. For more information about topical collecting, you can visit the American Topical Association website. Mm -hmm.